All right, praise God. We're going to be, uh, I'm going to read to you, um, if I can. There we go. All right. We're going to be reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 25. And it's actually, a, it's, it's a pretty long uh, passage of scripture. Uh, it's a pretty long passage of scripture, but we're going to read it. And if the Lord sees fit, then I'll put a little commentary in there. But I, before we get started, let me just say this to you. I'm reading to you a story. It's a literal narrative story, story, but I'm also using it as an allegorical illustration, all right? So I'm just kind of getting that up front. What are you trying to say? Within the story, I believe that there lies new, some New Testament theology to be found. Um, and so let's just read the story, and then we'll go to the New Testament in Romans chapter 7, and I'll explain to you what I'm trying to say. Amen? You ready? All right, here we go. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 1. Let me just say this to the, the immediate context of this story is that David has been anointed as king, but Saul is still on the throne. OK, and Saul is, is chasing him. And actually, David just found him in a cave and could have killed him, but didn't because he was anointed by God to be king. And, uh, and so now we transition to this next chapter, but that's the immediacy of what's of what's going on. So again, David's not sitting on the throne. He's been anointed as king, but he's on the run. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep, a thousand goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, just so that you understand a little bit of context about shearing the sheep, that was a big time event in, in this society that, that Israelite was. They were agrarian, but they were also shepherds. So whenever you, when a man of this substance would shear his sheep, it was a big to do. And it's almost like a, it almost turned into almost like a festival. I mean, I was never there, but that's what the context when you read the history is almost like the shrimp and petroleum festival on a, maybe a small, little bit of a smaller scale where, you know, they're out there, they're cooking and there's like tons of people and they're shearing the sheep and there's just all kinds of stuff going on. So there's a lot of movement taking place. And I just want you to see that. Now, the name of the man was Nabal. Now, really his name in Hebrew, if you look it up, it means fool. Okay, so let's not get too much into that. But look, the name of his wife was Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was curlish. The word curlish means he was very grievous. What it describes is that he had a very heavy hand. Okay, he was a, he was a taskmaster, if we could describe it that way. Anybody ever known a taskmaster before? And evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. You know, the Bible tells us that. We're not going to get into it too much. But the Bible wanted us to know he was from the house of Caleb. Now, you know, let me just say this real quick. I know I, I do take too many side notes oftentimes. But, you know, the word Caleb, the name Caleb literally means dog. In Caleb's sense, it was a good thing. Because, see, a dog is tenacious. What does that mean? A dog doesn't quit. The Caleb of the Old Testament that was partners with Joshua, that name tenacity, dogged, doggedness was a good thing because he wasn't a quitter. He went up against many a giant and he won and he refused to quit. But also, you know, a dog can also be stubborn sometimes. As much as I love my dog, sometimes that dog doesn't listen. In this case, he's letting us know he's of the house of Caleb. But listen, this man is not, it's not operating the way that God would have him operate. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, go to Nabal, greet him in my name. Thus shall you say to him that lives in prosperity, Peace be both to you, and peace be to your house. Peace be unto all that you have. And now I have heard that you have shearers, now your shepherds which were with us. So now David's giving, us, giving his men a little, reminding his men to remind Nabal, that there were some things that happened in the past. Your shearers, your shepherd, they were with us. There was a time whenever all my men were with your men, all right? And we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them. In other words, he's saying, we protected you, man. I don't know if you remember that or not, but me and my men, there was a time that we protected you. 
And all the while that when they were in Carmel, ask your, ask your young men and they will show you. Ask them, they'll tell you. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in your eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever comes to your hand unto your servants and to your son David. So basically, David, as king, he's the king. You may not be sitting on the throne right now. Question is, is Jesus the king of our hearts? That's a good point. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but personally for you and I, have we made him king of our own hearts? That's the story here. David is anointed as king, but is he ruling and reigning from the throne? Not yet. Okay. But David says, listen, we've already been in the field. We've already taken care of your people. Now we need something from you. And will you serve your son David? And when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David. And ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? That was David's dad. There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master, saying, Who are you? I mean, Saul, as far as I know, he's the king. Now I want you to know that typologically in the Bible, Saul is a type of the flesh. He's a type of the old way of doing business. Right? David is a type of Christ. He is a way of the new way of doing business. Amen. And that's really what we got going on here whenever we get to Romans 7. We're going to talk about the difference between the old way and the new way. And Nabal, he's trying to live in the old way. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it to men whom I know not where they be? So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. This is not good, folks. <laughs> and there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. But one of the young men told Abigail. Oh, thank the Lord for Abigail. She's the bride. You see her here? She's the bride. She's married to one man right now. Okay, but she's going to be married to somebody else in the future. But right now, she's a... She, you know who Abigail represents? She represents you, church. She's the bride. She's the bride of Christ. Amen. She wants to serve God. But right now, she's under a heavy hand. And she's not being released to serve God in the way that God has intended for her. I hope that makes sense. Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything, as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us. In other words, they protected us both by day, night and day. All the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider, what will you do? It's up to you, Abigail. What are you going to do? What kind of decision are you going to make? Who are you going to serve? You're going to serve the old way or the new way? Things are changing. What will you do? Evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot even speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, five sheep readily dressed, Five measures of parched corn. That's a lot of work right there, my friend. You hear me? She had to go pick and gather all that stuff. She had to kill, have these sheep butchered and cooked up. A hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and laid them on some donkeys. And she said unto her servants, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. And it was so, as she rode on that ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill, and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow has in the wilderness. I tried to take care of his stuff. So that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he has requited me evil for good. And so more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave all that pertain to him by the morning light. This, this is kind of weird King James stuff, but I'll explain it. If I leave morning light, any that pisseth against the wall. What is he talking about? That's the whole King James language for describing man. Okay, All the men are going to be dead by the time the morning shows up. All right? And when Abigail says, because men stand up. You get it? All right. 
And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, fool, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst sin. Now therefore my Lord as the Lord lives and as thy soul lives seeing the Lord has withholding thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Now this blessing which thy handmaid has brought unto my Lord let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee forgive the trespass of thine handmaid for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and even has not been found in thee all thy days. Yet a man is risen to pursue you and to seek your soul. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling. Isn't that interesting how she said that? I just caught that for the first time. They already know the history of David with Goliath. You know what I'm saying? She already, they already, the story's out. David done killed his, killed his giant. And it's just interesting to me how she references that. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning thee. And shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. That this shall be no grief unto thee nor offense of heart unto my Lord. Either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord then remember your handmaid. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent you this day to meet me. Boy, God is a good God. Listen, if David's a type of Christ, you see what's going on here? She's crying out. She, she's not trying to act like, but I haven't done anything wrong. She's just, she got the same spirit that Daniel had on Wednesday night whenever we were talking about him. He, Daniel includes himself in the folly of Israel. He's not trying to say, oh, I'm okay, everybody else is wrong. No, he's take, she's taking responsibility. She's including herself. Please forgive your servant. Please have mercy on your servant. And God, the word of God says in Isaiah chapter 60, a broken and a contrite spirit. He will not despise. Part of the problem that we have even in the body of Christ, even with the preacher, sometimes we don't recognize that we got our own faults and that we're, we're, we're feeling like we're okay. But the reality of it is, is that no, we're not. Quit looking at your neighbor. Quit looking at your spouse. Start realizing that the Lord wants to do a work in your heart. Amen. And let us humble ourselves in the presence of the king. There's a new way of doing business. Amen. And God wants to do business with our heart. And blessed be your advice. Blessed be you. Which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood. This is David still talking. From avenging myself with my own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, which has kept me back from hurting you, except you had hasted to come out, surely to, there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice, and have accepted your purse. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. He's doing good, right? Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him. Basically, from medical terminology, the best I can understand, he had a big old heart attack right there. And he became as a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after, that the Lord smote Nabal, that he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent, this is the, really the part out of all this stuff I read to you that I want you to get. You ready? And David <clears throat> sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. David sent for Abigail. To take her to him, to wife. I'm going to go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 7. But while, before we get into Romans 7, I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about this story. So the main thing in this story, listen, I don't want you just to get so caught up in the way that Nabal was. Because there's a lot of 
allegory that we could use to preach New Testament truth or biblical truth. The main point that I'm really trying to make here is that the story speaks of marriage and relationship. That's the main point I'm trying to extract from the story. It speaks of marriage and relationship. Abigail's marriage to Nabal was preventing her eventual marriage to King David. Does that make sense? While she was married, I'm about to get into some New Testament stuff here in a second, and it's going to make more sense. But while she was married to Nabal, the law states that you're married to this particular person, so you can't be married to another. Amen? But then once, as long, and so as long as Nabal was alive, she couldn't marry the king. She was in this previous relationship, this old order. She was under this this old relationship, and she couldn't move forward with the king. The first marriage to Nabal was hard and grievous. That's what he was. He was a <coughs> curlish man. Her second marriage was to a king who was soft towards God and compassionate towards the people. Abigail's marriages to these two men can be used to compare and contrast the Christian's relationship towards law and grace. Let me say that again. Abigail's marriage to these two men can be compared to a Christian's, a Christian's relationship. I'm not talking about an Old Testament Jew. I'm talking about a Christian's relationship, whether it be to law or grace. And we're going to try to break that down as we move forward, okay? Abigail is a type of the bride of Christ. I've already mentioned that. David is a type of Christ. And the way that I'm using this story is that Nabal is a type of the hard taskmaster of the law. Let me say that again. Nabal represents, in this case, the old order, which was the law of God. Now, there's things about Nabal that don't really line up, okay? The law is not evil, amen? The law is not evil, the law is of God. As a matter of fact, the apostle Paul said that. Is the law then sin unto me? God forbid. The law is holy and righteous and good, but I, according to Paul, am carnal and sold under sin. The problem is not the law of God. The problem is the sinful nature of mankind. The problem is, is that, and I'm going to, we'll break it down a little bit more. The problem is, is that when we try to continue to live under the old order, when in reality we're in a new season. And we're no longer in the Old Testament, Christian. We're now in the new covenant, amen. And the new covenant operates differently than the old covenant. We're no longer under the letter of the law. Okay, that, that says you either do it or you die. No, now we're under the newness of the spirit that flows in the new covenant. Amen? The law is stern and unforgiving. It doesn't want to allow people their freedom and their liberty to serve their king. There's a reason for this. I need you to understand that. As we will see in Romans 7, the same goes in the story here. Death frees the bride to be released from law. You hear me? Death. Freeze the bride to be released from the law or to be released from the first marriage so that she can be married to another, which is Christ Jesus. I'm telling you the word of God right now. We're about to read it. And to be married to the king that brings freedom. A very simple and important point to be made is that the focus of what is being described this morning is related again to how a person approaches their Christianity. Is the way they approach or see their walk with God based on rules and regulations? Somebody help me out here. You might be new to the faith. You might be old to the faith. If you've been coming to this church and you've been listening to the truth of New Testament theology for the message of the cross or the message of the finished work of Christ, however you want to describe it, then you might want to try to get bored with me. But you should never get tired of hearing the truth of New Testament gospel that says that you've been liberated and you've been set free. Hallelujah. Now what Jesus did when he died on the cross, paid the penalty of your sin, and it releases grace. It releases grace, which empowers the believer to be able to walk in freedom and in liberty. But listen, I didn't grew up in a works-based gospel. It don't work, my friend. A works-based gospel is built upon I'm supposed to perform. And every time that I fail, then I fail. It's not about the Christian's performance. Yes, God wants you to act like a Christian. God wants his people to be separated out from the world. 
God has always demanded that his people look different than the world. Is it okay to preach the truth? Now, I don't know what you're saying down the road. They might be saying something good. I don't know. But I do know this. It's not okay for the believer to continue to live like the world each and every day. No, 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 no. If the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, he's already contending with you. He's already moving and operating on you. And he's showing you and I the things that he wants to deal with. The question is, how do we let him deal with it? Because many times people struggle. And they're like, man, I'm still struggling with this. Okay? And they try, and they live under a, a cloud of condemnation and guilt. And I will probably say that more than once, because it's in my notes. <laughs> they live under a cloud of condemnation and guilt, because they're looking at their own performance. They're living, listen, the law is all about performance. The letter of the law is all about rules and regulations. The word of God says in the book of James, and he doesn't keep the law to the entirety of its extent. It's failed the law in all points. If you can't keep it to the perfection, then you failed it. Paul said in Galatians that the law is our schoolmaster. It was for a period of time to point the way to the Christ. But then when Jesus came and offered his sinless perfection, kept the law, your perfection and offered that perfect life that kept the law on the cross. Hallelujah. He ushered in a new time frame. It's a time frame of grace. It's a time frame of liberty. It's a new way of doing things. It's not Nabal anymore. It's David. And you got to, you can't be married to both of them. There has to be, and there's a death. We're about to get into Romans 7. There's a death that separates the two. Amen. When a person's relationship with God is based on their faith in Jesus and his work, it's the work of Jesus that allows access to grace and it's grace that gives power to God to live a pleasing life towards God. I don't know if any of you know what I'm talking about. How long have you been in the faith? You don't have to raise your hand, but I mean, is it 20 or more years? Is it 15 or more years? Is it 10 or more years? Is it five or more years? Is it one to three years? I don't know. You know, fill in your blanks. But I'm going to tell you something. Even if you've been sitting in a church that preaches the message of the cross, the finished work of Christ, New Testament truth, whatever you want to call it. I don't care how long you've been in it. At some point in time, you have tried to live for God in your own strength in some way, shape, or form. You have tried to perform for God. Oh, let me read more. Yeah, you better read more because you ain't never going to learn about Jesus if you don't read more. But listen to me, it's a really, it's a gray area. There used to be a song, I don't remember who sang it, and that's probably not even what they were singing about. But they said, something, it was something about when it fades away, when black and white turn to gray. It's a, who, you know what I'm talking about? What was that song? Who was that? Casting crown slow fade. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. When black and white turn to gray, they were probably talking about sin in a person's life. But what I'm trying to tell you is it's a slow fade when you move from New Testament truth into law and performance and rules and regulations. And I'm going to keep on striving and I'm going to I'm going to get her done. I can remember sitting in my sister's back room when I first got saved and I'm over there dipping <coughs> Kodiak, and I'm shoving a can and I have in my lip and the Lord's convicting me because I'm, I'm scared I'm going to get cancer in my lip. And I'm looking at my gums and my lips and my tongue and I got sores and I'm like, God, you got to set me free. I don't want to be a bondage to this anymore. I go off so I take that whole roll and throw it in the gum. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And then two days later, Daniel, please send me some Kodiak. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to be in bondage. And I'm like, I'm going to do it tomorrow, Lord. I promise I ain't going to shove that stuff in my lap tomorrow. I'm going to read some of this Bible and I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to do it, Lord. I promise you I'm going to do it. I promise, God. Yeah, yeah, that's a genuine heart, right? I promise, God, I'm not going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> Boy, like about 1 o'clock, working with all them guys in the pipe yard. And they all got a dip in their lip. I've been dipping since I was 13. Come on, man. Hook a brother up. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, is that you ain't gonna get nothing done, Junior. <laughs> no, if you're gonna get, if it's gonna, if freedom and liberty is going to come in any area of your life, it's gonna be because you come to a realization that Jesus has already purchased victory for you on the cross. The old man that you were, I know I keep preaching it, I keep on showing it, but let's not get tired of the truth. 
the old man that you were the first time you were born, your name is Adam. Put your name right there. That's old man, Ephesians chapter 4, old man. The old man was born in a natural birth. When he gushed forth in water from his mother's womb, he was born in physicality. He was born with a sinful nature. He was born with the nature of Adam. The new man is born again in Christ. The second Adam who came to make right what the first Adam made wrong. That's what it means to be born again. You put faith in the truth of the gospel that says Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin. Your old man, Romans 6, we just got through with that, was baptized or immersed or placed in the person of Christ through faith. That means in God's mind, the Father's mind, when you got saved, I don't know when you got saved, 15, 20, 15, 30, 5 years ago, 2 years ago. When you got saved, whether you knew it or not... <clears throat> A miracle happened in the spiritual realm. I can't get this point across enough. Whether you realize it or not, I didn't even realize it, dude. I was 19. I went up to the altar with hair down and rags on my back, hair down my back. And I went and I did the preacher, Sister Touch, she said, Come up here, give your heart to Jesus. And I took off. And I'm like, Lord, I need you. Please save me. I didn't know what was happening. I just knew I was a wretched sinner. And I believe Jesus died for my sin. Then fast forward all these years, like, Throw the dip in the golf and please, Danielle, send me some more. Why am I struggling? Why am I contending? Why can't I get free? Because the same way I bow my knee right there is the way I got to bow my knee every day. Colossians 2.6 says the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. How did you receive him? Preacher, faith. What was the object of your faith? Oh, this is, now we're getting good right here. I know you've done heard it a million times, but you can't get old. It can't get old because if we really understood it, even the preacher, we'd really be walking in it. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. The object of your faith. What are you talking about? Faith is a very abstract concept. Yeah, and what I'm saying is faith has to rest on something. What, what, the word of faith movement just says, you know what the word of faith movement did? They put their faith in their faith. Come on, somebody. They put their faith in their positive confession. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Do y'all even know what I'm talking about? I'll just say, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Joyce Meyer. Can I just say it on television? <laughs> Kenneth Hagin, Joyce Meyer, Kenneth Copeland. Uh, you know, there's a slew of them. I, you know, what do they do? I, went, I walked outside <laughs> of a bank one time. And I don't think the person's watching, but I was talking to somebody about it the other day. I parked at Morgan City Bank in the back, and I didn't realize the two doors almost look exactly the same. When I went in to visit this person, I followed them out the front door and didn't even realize I had walked out a different door. I'm in the parking lot, and I'm like, oh, Lord, where's my car, man? My memory. Don't say it! Don't say it! <laughs> I'm like, dude, like, calm down, man. He didn't, want me to, he didn't want me to confess that my memory was slipping a little bit. No, dude, if I don't come to grips with reality, I can't get a healing from the king. I'm just trying to make a point. That's right. Even Sister Tut, God bless her soul, because I'm so grateful for that sister's ministry. Yeah. She's standing up here, and she wouldn't say the word arthritis. I feel it in my bones. You're a liar, Arthur. I rebuke you, Arthur. <laughs> she wouldn't even call it arthritis. She'd call it Arthur. <laughs> My, my, my point is, is that they put in faith in their positive confessions. You understand that? They're putting faith in their faith. You can't say a negative thing. Listen, I believe in a positive confession. Yeah. I'm like, I am a child of God. I am a king's kid. My God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. I'll never see this seed but forsaken or begging bread. I'm above and not below. I'm the head and not the tail. I got the, the blessings of Deuteronomy on my life because of Jesus. I believe in all that. But come on, man, that's not where my object of my faith is. Okay. The object of my faith is Jesus. <laughs> that doesn't just sound right, church. The object of my faith is Jesus Christ and what he did for me at the cross. Faith in that ushered me into the new covenant. Now that I'm in the new covenant, I have access to grace. I'm no longer married to Nabal, church. I'm married to King David. Hallelujah. That I'm no longer under the old order. I'm now under the new. Amen. Amen. And in the new, there's blessing. There's no longer that grievance. See, that's part of the problem. I want you to understand this. If you're living under a system of law or works, many times you will walk around 
with a dark cloud over your head. You will feel weighted down. Mm -hmm. You will feel burdened because you're trying to live for God in your own strength. That's right. Release that. Let go of that today, my friend. <clears throat> Give it over to the Lord. Now, at the same time, and this is not what I'm preaching on, sometimes it's not law, sometimes it's lust. If you put your faith in law, it will open the door to sin and it will give power to sin. And if you keep surrendering to lust, guess what? It's going to give power to sin. Can I say that again? If you keep surrendering to lust, it will give power to sin. But that's, that's the difference. In the new covenant, you've been given power from on high to start saying no. Amen. And it's the Lord doing it. Now we got to start walking in it. Start walking and start choosing the Lord. Amen? So let's go to Romans chapter 7. And let's just talk a little bit about this. It says in verse 1, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. You see that? As long as he liveth. I don't know. Let's see if this works right here. Probably not. As, as long as he lives. So what does that what does that mean? Does that mean that does that mean that I have to die physically in order to be free from under the bondage of the law? I just want you to know right now we're about to read just a few more verses. I'm not going to keep you here all morning. I promise. But what we're talking about here is the same way we died to sin. You remember how we died to sin? That in the mind of God, we died with Jesus. Does that make sense? What I'm trying to say? That, you remember all that stuff I just said when I was all excited? That when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit baptized or put you in Jesus. Whether you realized it or not on that day, that's what happened. When I was that 19-year-old boy at the altar, that's what happened. I didn't understand it till later what happened. But I need you to understand that when you first got saved, the old man that you were in the mind of God was baptized or placed into Christ. And in the mind of God, that old man died with him at the cross. It's almost like God hit reverse on the, the video. And now he sees you in Jesus dying at the cross, being buried in the tomb. That's Romans chapter 6. I didn't make that up. See, the word water is not even in the Greek right there. We don't have time to break all that down again, but what, it, what it's talking about is through faith, your old man died in Christ. Your old man was buried in Christ. Your new man has been resurrected to newness of life. So what I'm needing you to understand is, is that when it says the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives, it means as long as you're living in your first birth. Does that make sense? As long as you're living in your first birth, the law is where... Every single person that's been born since the law is going to either be judged by the law. It doesn't matter whether they knew it or not. That's God's righteous judgment. Does that make sense? God gave, God set apart Israel for himself and gave them the law. Whether or not the rest of the world in India or China or anywhere else recognizes that. I don't have time to get into all that, but that... Mankind has always made his own choices. People are like, that's not fair. God's going to, no, 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 it's very fair. Because if you went back to the beginning, you would realize that God revealed himself from the very beginning. But humanity in their rebellious and stiff-necked heart has chosen to go their own way, which has caused a wake of destruction behind them. Whole communities, whole nations, whole families. When a dad rejects Jesus, guess what? The children, they may not ever come back to the Lord. Don't blame that on God. I told, one of, I told one of Danielle's uncles one time for Christmas. I'm like, sir, just the same way you've rejected the Lord and your son, you, that's why you, your children probably aren't serving the Lord. I don't mean that to be rude. I'm just saying it. It leaves a wake behind you. When each human being makes a choice not to choose Jesus, it doesn't just affect you, sir. You have rejected the gospel. You have rejected Jesus Christ, and it's going to affect everybody behind you. It will not only affect your, your family, it will affect, affect your community, it will affect the nation. And God is righteous and just because he's given his law to his people Israel. A light unto the nations. That's it. But people reject. The law has dominion over a man. I don't care what nationality he is, what color his skin is, what gender he is, she is. 
The law has dominion over man as long as he lives, but if he would die in Christ, he no longer has to live under the dominion of that law. He now, he now Nabal died. See, th th that's what changes everything is a death. I understand the analogy doesn't work perfectly, but that's what changes everything is a death changes the relationship. Jesus' death and now our death in him changes the relationship. We no longer have to live under law. We can now live under the new covenant. Amen. The New Testament teaches us that there is a spiritual law in place where law and sin work together and keep people entangled in bondage. That's a hard concept to understand. And we're going to get into that more. It's not in these verses that we're about to finish reading. But I want you to know that next week... I want you to understand that there is a there is a working together between the law and sin. God did not create the law as something evil. The law itself is not sin. But check this out. It, it, let me just say it like this: It's never. It's not a sin to read the Bible, right? Y'all follow me? It's not a sin to read the Bible. It's not a sin to pray. It's not a sin to go to church. It's not a sin to get involved in ministry. But can I say something? And I hope you get it. And you're watching on video, if this is the first time you heard it, I'm sorry if this is the first time you heard it, I'm just going to tell you the truth. It is a sin to put your faith for victory or for righteousness in how much Bible you read, in how much you pray, and how much you go to church. Because those things are not what gives you victory over sin. What gives you victory over sin is what Jesus already did at the cross. Now your job my job is to believe that what he did was enough. That's when the Apostle Paul says, fight the good. What did he say? Fight the good fight of sin. Is that what he said? No. He said, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. This is some deep stuff we're talking about, Christian. And some of you might not have even heard it spoken like this before. But that's because the preacher wasn't preaching New Testament truth that is found in the revelation of what the Apostle Paul got while he was in the wilderness of Arabia <laughs> as he struggled himself in Romans chapter 7. Okay, Most people don't even go to Romans 7 because they don't, they're scared of it because they don't understand it. That's not okay. We need to understand these things. Alright. The law has dominion over man as long as he lives, but we're not talking about his physicality, we're talking about his spirituality. <coughs> Notice how it's death again. Our death with Jesus severed us from the power of sin, Romans 6. That's what we're talking about. Our death in Jesus severed us from the power of sin in Romans 6. Romans 7 teaches us that our death in Jesus severs us from the dominion of the law. Does that make sense? I hope it does. But the default position, you ready for this from the fall? What is a default position? I don't know a lot about computers, but I know if you leave them alone for long enough, it goes back to the screen. Right? It goes back to the screen. The default position of the fallen man is to try to work his own righteousness. Let me say that again. You ready? The default position of fallen man is to try to work his own righteousness. What you talking about, preacher? Fig leaves. Immediately. Y'all read the story in Genesis chapter 3? After the fall of Adam and Eve? What is the first thing they do? They hide themselves behind a tree and they cover their nakedness with fig leaves. We don't have time to talk about the theology in that, dude. We could preach a whole hour on the clothing of the, of the believer. But, but immediately, as soon as they sin, they become sin conscious. They realize that they're naked. I must cover myself. I don't know how I'm going to remedy this problem. Let me go ahead and sew some fig leaves together and let me cover my nakedness. The default position of the fallen man is to try to fix it himself. And listen, this isn't just for lustful sin. This is for every aspect of your life. You hear me? Financial woes, you'll try to fix it yourself. Come on, somebody, help me out with a pay payday loan. That's right. You'll try to fix anything that you can and get yourself dig deeper and deeper and deeper into a hole. It, does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? Instead of be still and know that I'm God. Amen. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. Let you hear the voice of God. We're just trying to get ahead of the Lord. Amen? I'm preaching a bunch of stuff here. All right, the, but it's the work of God that accomplishes the victory in our life. It's the work of Jesus that gives us access to grace. Look at this, Romans chapter five, verses one and two. Look at this. 
Therefore, being justified by faith. Do y'all know what justified means? Listen, I was in the Pentecostal church for 12 years and didn't even know what justified meant. That's a chronic shame. The word justified means to be made innocent, to be declared by God as innocent. Well, what is he talking about? How did, therefore, how did I get made innocent? Because he already introduced us to Jesus. In chapter 3 and chapter 4, he's introduced us to what true righteousness is, and that true righteousness is Jesus. So now that you're a believer, you're justified by faith, now you have peace with God. How? Through Jesus Christ. Not because of how much you do or what you do. Look at this. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace. You know one of the things that I love about this, and I've, I know that I've kind of shared it before. I don't even know you're going to be able to see that. Uh, it, it's, uh, I'm not going to be able to show it to you. But look, this is, this is let, me just, let me just write this down if I can here real quick. Um, grace. You ready for this? I know that I've given this uh, definition a lot of times before. And uh, let's see. Grace. All right. This is it. This is the definition of grace. A divine. What is what does divine mean to you? Godly, right? God. A divine influence on what? The heart. And its reflection in the light. Well, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that grace does something to the inner man that changes him inwardly to the point where it becomes reflected outwardly. So it's no longer you trying to fix yourself from the outside. It's you and I surrendering to the Lord, keeping our faith in Christ. And the result is the Holy Spirit's doing a work on the inside of us. And now we're seeing it reflected in our life. Does that make sense? Amen. So there's a, but there's a spiritual relationship between law and sin. Again, the law isn't sin, but the way God's spiritual laws work when a person during the time of grace tries to live by law, that is sin. That's what I was trying to say earlier. So it's not a sin to read the Bible, to pray, to pray, to go to church, to be involved in ministry. It's a sin when you begin to put your faith in those things for victory or to be righteous in the eyes of God because now you're putting your faith in your performance instead of the performance of Jesus. That's what I was trying to say earlier when I tried to sing that song. It's a slow fade. It's a slow because now black and white is turning to gray. It's a gray area. But these are good things. Why would this cause trouble in my life? You, you can eat from any tree other than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, before I knew that there was good and evil, I only knew God. But now that I've eaten of this tree, boom, default position, pick up my own work, sell my own fig leaves, put my faith in something good, my own performance, try to fix it in my own strength instead of, instead of resting and allowing God. I hope that makes sense. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. I got a few scriptures here. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. This is sin, not law. For you, why? Because you're not under the law, but you're under grace. So when you move under the new covenant, the grace of the, of the Holy Spirit, the new way of doing things, the David relationship instead of the naval relationship, grace is giving you power and strength. Look at this scripture here, Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2 verses 20 and 21. Here we go. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Look at this. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Let me say that again. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in man. When you and I try to approach God under the old order, we frustrate the grace of God in us. I hope, I hope some of this is starting to make a little bit of sense. Look at John. We used this one last week. John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. And then they said unto him, 
those that were trying to make him king. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? You see their default position. <laughs> under the old, they're still operating under the old covenant. They got to work, 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 work. I got to perform. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. Hear me. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Hallelujah. How can you say it any more simple? Right out the mouth of your Lord and Savior. Right out of the mouth of the one who died for you. This is the work of God that you would believe on him whom the Father has sent. The work of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Amen. Matthew 11. Shared this scripture with somebody the other day. Struggling, fighting, frustrated. Come on somebody. This is a good one for me to remind myself of. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You ever find yourself so frustrated you're about to pull your hair out? Come on, Chris. You don't look all look holy and righteous to me. You know you feel it sometimes, that, that turmoil in your spirit, man. Whenever you feel that, guess what? That ain't the Lord. That's you. Look, you got it. Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. A yoke connects two beasts of burden that do work together. He says, my yoke. I'm the workhorse in this relationship. Won't you surrender to me? Won't you let me do the work? Won't you put me in the battle? Won't you let me go before you and pave the way and learn of me? For I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. For your soul. I don't know about you, but I don't want to rest for my soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, he, Jesus ain't like Nabal. Jesus is not all grievous man. He's not a curtis man. He's not a taskmaster. He's not trying to hold nobody in bondage. He's trying, he wants to let set people free. He gave his life so that you and I could be free. Law results in a relationship that mandates the bride perform her duties. And is judged based on the performance of those duties. Let me say that again. Law results in a relationship that mandates the bride perform her duties. And she's judged based on her performance. I'll never forget my mama told me a story. Picking on my old daddy. And, she, and he was an old Marine. And she said, Matthew, your daddy had come home. I don't know how long that she put up with that. Because at some point now she started getting pretty sassy. And I don't blame her. But he'd come home from, from offshore. And he literally... <laughs> This dude was a trip, y'all. He put a white glove on. And he walk up to the refrigerator. And he said, what is this? <laughs> it's like, really, dude? <laughs> of course, he was pretty mean. Oh, anyway, let's not get into all the gym. Anymore. Point, the point is, is that the bride better perform. You get the idea behind there? That's a navel, huh? All right. The Lord, he was also a soft man to some extent. All right. Grace. Versus law is a relationship that allows the bride freedom to willingly choose the love of the bridegroom that was sent. And that relationship is evaluated off the performance of the bridegroom. Now listen, I want you to understand this. This is the beauty of grace. An inside job that's reflected outwardly. What I'm trying to say is, is that when the bride surrenders to the new order and continues to walk in her new marriage with David. Now what's happening is that grace is doing the work on the inside. And now we're being changed outwardly. So our behavior starts to line up because God's doing the work in, on the inside instead of us trying to manufacture it on the outside. Does that make sense? It's a real simple message. Mm -hmm. I know I had a preacher that I used to sit under. Lord, help your soul right now, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. You're not supposed to be a motivational speaker. You're not supposed to be teaching people about yoga. And you, so get your heart right. But nevertheless, he, he, had, he was much better with words than me. And the comment that he made one time is grace is an inside job. You had a little play on words there. It's an inside job. Grace is an inside job. The grace of the Holy Ghost does something on the inside. Amen? All right. Romans chapter 7, and I'm about to close with this, and this is how I'm tying the two stories back together. All right, look at this. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. This is the analogy. See, people all, all the time thought that this was a teaching on divorce. And I'm not trying to get into that, but it's not God's will for people to get a divorce. That's right. Okay? But, but, but nevertheless, that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about your relationship with the law versus your relationship with Jesus. All right? And things happen in people's lives. Amen? All right, here we go. For the woman which has a husband, Abigail, right, under Nabal, 
is bound by the law to Nabal or her husband or the law. So that as long as he lives, but if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So let's just make a point right here. You can't. Be a New Testament Christian and continue to try to live for God according to the Old Testament performance standard. That's, right. That's why Jesus said you don't put new wine in an old wineskin. Because the wineskin will burst. The new, you can't put the, you gotta have a new wineskin. In other words, he's talking about the new covenant. It's a parable, but that's what he's talking about. And if you try to do that, Christian, you're going to frustrate the grace of God because it's sin. Because you're putting your faith in an old order of things. And basically, without realizing it, I know you would never do this on purpose, and I never did it on purpose. We're basically, in a way, kind of like saying, yeah, but Jesus, what you did wasn't enough. It's the same thing, listen, whenever all these modern-day churches... And people don't like it when I start doing it. But let's just tell the truth. When these modern day churches don't understand the gospel for the way it's written and they're not describing it this way, what do they do? People are struggling, so what do they do? They hire Christian counselors. Oh, he told me on video not to go see a You go see a counselor if you want to. That's not what I'm trying to say. But when you start amalgamating psychology with theology, now you're adding to you're, and you're taking away, basically, are we saying that what Jesus did wasn't enough? Listen, we all go through seasons in our life. We all go through valleys. I'm not even trying to sit here and pretend that people don't ever, you know, because until you understand these things and you're willing to surrender to them and you feel like you're having these major depressive episodes and you feel like, I'm just trying to be clear here so that nobody takes me out of context and you feel like you need to be on some medication, go get on the medication. That's not what I'm even trying to say here. But what I am trying to say is that ain't the answer, my friend. That ain't nothing but a band-aid on a cancer. Whenever we got something that needs healing, and listen, I'll say it like this because I had people challenge me before, but the word soul in the Greek is, is suke. Here we go. I know I've said it before. Suke. All right? Right there. Mind, will, emotions. Your soul is directly connected to your psyche. Only Jesus can heal your psyche. All I'm trying to say is that's another order of things. Oh, let me pray more. Let me read more. I'm going to make myself righteous. I'm going to perform better for God. Oh, I'm struggling in the faith and I can't get free. Let me add a Christian counselor. Oh, I can't do this. So let me add that. And the church, because they don't know and understand the truth and they're not preaching the truth, they buy into that. And they're like, hey, let's hire a bunch of counselors to try to help the people. And what they're doing is they're mixing psychology with theology. Sorry. Human wisdom is demonic and devilish. That's what James says. Wisdom that is from above is from the Lord. Psychology was built off of Sigmund Freud. Really, dude? Did you even read about that guy? Anyway, let me not get started. I'm not fussing. I promise you, I'm just trying to tell the truth. All right? All right. So she'll be caught an adulteress if she has to have those two relationships. But if her husband be dead, Mabel died. She is free from that law. She, was, she is no longer an adult. She can marry David now, my friend. <clears throat> Mabel died. His heart was hard. It's the whole order of things. And he passed away. And guess what David says? Give me my bride. So that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law. How? By the body of Christ. That you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Boy, I tell you, this is so, I'm telling you right now, this is so rich with biblical truth. But I want to leave you with this one concept. Maybe the musicians and the singers could come forward. We'll close the service in worship. And if you need prayer, the altars are always open. But I want you to see what that says. <coughs> The old order died. She married a new husband. That husband is Jesus. And look what it says. That you should bring forth fruit. What happens whenever a husband and a wife come together? Many times, new offspring, new fruit. In spiritual speaking, when you and I 
are married to Christ and we understand how to walk what happens, we produce fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is produced in our life, but also God uses us in other people's lives. Amen? And fruit is produced through the power of the Holy Spirit. God wants to do a work in your heart. God wants to do a work in my heart. The simple message today is, is that you're no longer under the old order, my friend. You don't have to work based on your own performance. The simple message is you're under a new order. Jesus is the husband. He's the one who did the performance. Trust in him. Surrender to him. Sit back and watch the Holy Spirit produce fruit in your life. You'll work harder for Jesus once you get a hold of this revelation than you ever did before. Trust me. You'll read more, pray more, go to church more, get involved in ministry more. Tell more people about Jesus when you allow the Holy Spirit to do the work through grace. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.